Hey guys, welcome back to Cold Realm. My name is Alex, and in this video, we're going to talk about the important topic of authentication on the web. So we're going to cover session-based versus token-based authentication. We're also going to cover cookies, JWT, as well as client storage. So we have a lot of topics to cover, so let's get right into it. Now, first of all, talking about authentication, it's important to make it a distinction between authentication and authorization. So authentication to remind you is, of course, the process of verifying the identity of the user. So it's essentially determining who the user actually is. And then authorization, on the other hand, is the process of verifying user permissions. So in essence, what user is able and not able to do in the system. And of course, because of that distinction, the HTTP status codes are also going to be different. So for failed authentication, the status code would be 401 unauthorized. Now, even though we're talking about authentication here, the status text is unauthorized, but the status code is 401, and that's the important point. Now, for failed authorization, the status code would be 403, and the status text would be forbidden. Now, talking about the username and password scheme, and of course, there's also other types of schemes like certificate scheme or hardware token scheme. But in this case, specifically talking about the username and password scheme, we can distinguish between stateful and stateless authentication. Now, stateful Authentication is mostly talked about in the context of sessions using a cookie. And when talking about stateless auth, we're typically referring to tokens using something like JWT or OAuth or something similar. So now let's have a high level overview of the flow in a session based auth. So the first thing that's going to happen is that the user is going to submit login credentials, which is typically the email and password. The server is going to verify the credentials against the database, so comparing the email and the password against the records for the existing user. The server is then going to create a temporary user session, and it's going to identify that session with a random string known as a session ID. And that session ID is typically going to be placed inside of a cookie, which is going to be sent back to the client. So once the user receives the cookie from the server, it's then going to send that cookie along with each subsequent request to the server. The server is going to validate the cookie against the session store. And if the validation is successful, it's of course going to grant the user access to the requested resources on the server. Now, when the user decides to log out, the server is going to destroy the session and it's also going to clear out the cookie on the client side. Now, talking about some of the features of session auth, every user session is going to be stored server side. And this is why this approach in auth is known as stateful. It's because the sessions are persisted in the server side storage. Now this storage could be memory. So for example, the sessions could be stored in a file system. Now, of course, this approach is less scalable and it's not very common in production systems. A more common approach would be storing sessions in a cache. Most often this would be something like Redis or memcached. But in other use cases, the user sessions could also be stored in a database. So for example, a Postgres database or MongoDB. Now each user is going to be identified by a session ID. And it's also what's known as an opaque reference. Now what opaque means is that no third party is going to be able to extract any data out of that session ID. Because remember, the session ID doesn't really carry any meaningful data. It's simply a random string or identifier. And it's only the issuer or the actual server that created the session ID is going to be able to map that session ID back to the actual user data. Now, the session ID is going to be stored in a cookie, and that cookie is often going to be signed with a secret stored on the server. Now, the process of cryptographically signing the cookie is done in such a way that the client will not be able to tamper with the contents of that cookie. Now, this way, the server is going to guarantee that the cookie was not modified and that the contents of that cookie could be trusted. Now, oftentimes, the cookies are also protected with special server-side flags, which we're going to talk about in a second. And now, talking generally about sessions, session-based auth is often used in server-side web applications. It's often widely used in frameworks, including Spring and Rails, and of course, a lot of other ones. And it's also very much prevalent in scripting languages like PHP. So now that we've talked about sessions very briefly, let's now move on our discussion talking about cookies. So cookie is essentially a header, just like authorization or content type. It's really not much different from those two. Cookies are often used in session management and personalization and tracking of users. Every cookie will consist of a name as well as a value assigned to it. And it can also optionally have attributes or flags. The cookie itself will be set with the set cookie header by the server. And when that same cookie is sent along by the browser to the server, it's going to be contained within the cookie header. Now, what is a typical structure of a cookie? Over here, I have a sample response from a server. So for example, imagine that you are submitting 
your email and password to the server. The server has completed the verification of your credentials and it's now ready to issue the session ID cookie back to your browser. So the server will typically send something like HTTP 1.1 to 100 successful response. It's probably going to have a content type. So for instance, in a server side rendered app, it might be text HTML. And then the important part is over here, the one that says set cookie. And this segment, as you probably guessed, is simply a header, just like content type. And this one sets a cookie. In this case, it's session ID. The value is assigned with the equal sign symbol. And the actual value is basically this session ID identifier over here. Now it's also delimited with a semicolon. We have a space, and then we have several attributes on the right. So we have a domain. In this case, it's set to example.com delimited by a semicolon in the space. And we also have path set to forward slash, meaning anything on the example.com website. Now let's talk a bit about the security associated with the cookies. So the cookies are often signed with a secret that is stored securely on the server side. And it's often signed with the HMAC SHA-256 algorithm. Now, the reason that the cookie is signed is once again to mitigate the tampering on the client side. So this is really done in such a way that the client won't be able to modify the contents of the cookie. And even if they try to, it's going to break the signature of that cookie. This way, the server will be able to detect the modification very quickly. Now, the cookies can be encrypted, though it's not done very often with session ID cookies. And if it is done, it's often done with the AS algorithm. And the purpose is basically to protect the cookies from being read by the client. Now talking about session ID cookies, it's really not a security concern for us if the third party is able to read the cookies. It's really because the cookies themselves don't really carry any meaningful data inside of them. Once again, the cookie itself really just contains the session ID token inside of it. And besides that, even if the cookie is encrypted, it still maintains a one-to-one -one match or one-to-one -one relationship back to the user session. So if that cookie is stolen for some reason, the person who obtains that cookie will still be able to use it to log into the session. So it really doesn't add any layers of security at all. The cookies are also going to be URL encoded. Now that's not done for security purposes, but it's really done for compatibility because some of the characters inside of cookies have to be URL encoded. Now I've already mentioned the term attributes and flags. So let's have a closer look at those two. We have several attributes, including domain and path. So these ones allow to narrow down the scope of a cookie. So in this case, the cookie can only be used on a given site and route. And this is what the domain and path attributes allow you to control and modify. Now the expiration attribute is used to set an expiry date for a cookie. And that means that the browser will only be able to use that cookie until the specified expiry date. Now, in some cases, the expiry date is going to be omitted. And what that means is that the cookie is going to become what's called a session cookie. It's a special type of cookie and most browsers will treat it in such a way that when the browser session is closed, that session cookie is going to be deleted. So in essence, it has a very short lifespan. Let's also talk about some of the flags for cookies. So one of the most important flags would be the HTTP only flag. What this one does is when it's specified on the cookie, it tells the browser that that cookie is not supposed to be accessed by JavaScript client side. So that cookie can only be read by the server when it's submitted to it, but no JavaScript code should be able to access it. Now the secure flag is used for HTTPS connections and it tells the browser that that cookie can only be sent over an encrypted TLS channel. And then there's also another flag that's been introduced in recent years and it's known as same site. This one tells the browser and the server that that cookie can only be sent from the same domain. In other words, this flag doesn't allow for any course sharing of the cookie. When dealing with session-based authentication using cookies, we are exposing ourselves to an attack known as CSRF or cross-site request forgery. And we're going to talk about different types of attacks and attack vectors in the upcoming videos. But to mention it very briefly, CSRF is essentially the act of performing unauthorized actions on behalf of the authenticated user. So imagine that the user is already authenticated to the system. A third party site may try to initiate actions on behalf of that user without that user's permissions. Now the CSRF attacks are typically mitigated using a CSRF token. We're going to of course talk about that in more detail, but for now, just remember that that CSRF token can be also sent in a separate X CSRF token cookie along with the session ID cookie as well. So we had a high level overview of sessions and also cookies. So now let's talk about token-based authentication. The flow in the token-based authentication goes as follows. 
So just like before, the user is going to submit login credentials to the server. Once again, this is going to include the email and password in most cases. The server is then going to verify the credentials against the database. And you could see that the first two steps are exactly identical to the session-based auth. Now the third step becomes more interesting. Instead of generating a session on the server, the server is actually going to generate a temporary token. And oftentimes it's also going to embed user data in it. The server is then going to respond back to the client with the token and the token can be embedded either in the body of the response or sent along as a header. Now, once the user receives the token from the server, it's oftentimes going to store it in a client storage, which could be local storage or session storage. The user is then going to take that token and also send it along with each subsequent request. And this way the user can actually authenticate with the server using that token. The server is then going to verify the token for authenticity and it's going to grant or reject access to the server resources. And finally, if the user decides to log out, the token is typically cleared out from the client storage. So now talking about some of the features of token-based auth, tokens are not stored server-side, and this is different from sessions. If you remember, the sessions are typically stored in a cache like Redis, but tokens are not stored anywhere. The tokens are actually only issued to the client so it really becomes the responsibility of the client to manage the storage of those tokens. And this is why this approach is known as stateless, as opposed to stateful, as it is in the case of sessions. The tokens themselves are going to be signed with a secret, just like session IDs placed in a cookie. And once again, this also protects us against tampering. So again, we want to make sure that the client doesn't try to modify the contents of that token to try to change the data that's contained within it. And for the server, this makes sure that the token is verified and can also be trusted. The tokens themselves can be either opaque, just like session IDs, or they can also be self-contained. Now we already talked about session IDs. The session IDs, if you remember, are opaque because session IDs are simply identifiers. They're only random strings that don't convey any meaningful data. But in some cases, the tokens can actually contain meaningful data inside of the payload. If that's the case, the token is referred to as self-contained. That's because the token is gonna carry all the required data for the transaction inside of its body or payload. In some cases, this also allows us to reduce database lookups because the server, if it can trust the token, it can actually look inside of the payload and infer who the user actually is by looking at the data contained within that token. And while this is an upside for architecture and performance, this actually exposes us to XSS attacks because unless the token is encrypted, the data contained within it will be publicly accessible. Now the tokens themselves are typically sent in the authorization header. And when a token is about to expire, it can often be refreshed. And it is for this reason that the client is often issued both the access and refresh tokens. The access tokens will be used for authentication and the refresh tokens or the token, because usually it's one of each, the refresh token will be used for renewing the access token. And last up, the token-based auth in and of itself is often used in single-page web applications. It's also widely used between web APIs, and it has its own uses in mobile apps as well. So now let's talk about JWT or JSON Web Tokens. What is JWT? Well, first of all, it's an open standard, which was introduced around 2012. It's a standard for authorization and information exchange on the web, and it allows for compact, self-contained, and URL-safe tokens. Those tokens are typically going to be signed and they can be either signed with a secret, in which case this is going to be a symmetric signature, or they can also be signed with a public private key pair, in which case it's going to be an asymmetric signature. Now let's look at a sample response from the server. So once again, imagine that you are sending off your email and password to the server. The server has verified the credentials and the server is once again ready to issue the JWT back to the client or the browser. In this case, once again, we get an HTTP 1.1, 200 successful response. We get one header, which is content type set to application JSON. And we also get this authorization header. This authorization header contains a value. First of all, we get the bearer scheme. And then after a space, we also get the token itself. Now it might seem like the token is on the new line. In fact, in this case, it's so big, it doesn't actually fit on the line. But in real life scenario, it's actually going to be on the same line. And of course, it's also going to be separated by a space after the bearer scheme. Now upon closer inspection, you're actually going to see that the token contains several parts. So it contains a header, which typically will include some meta information about the token. It's also going to contain a payload with a bunch of claims or data attributes. And last up, it's also going to contain a signature. And of course, all of those three parts are going to be delimited by a dot or a period. 
if you look at the example response we have in the middle over here, you're going to see the first part delimited by a period, and this is going to be the header of the token. We're going to have the body, which is the longest part in the middle, and of course we're going to have a signature after a period symbol. Now as it turns out, the token is going to be base64 URL encoded, and because of that we can actually use a global ATOB function in JavaScript to go ahead and decode that token. So if we go ahead and take out the first part, which is the header out of that token that we saw before, if we go ahead and decode it, we're actually going to see that we get a JSON data. In fact, if you look closely, you're going to see that the first part of the header begins with AJ, which of course stands for an opening curly brace as well as a double quote. So this way you can easily infer that the token actually contains JSON data. But once again, in this case, we get a JSON object that contains the algorithm, in this case, SHA-256, a symmetric key signature, and we also have a type of the token, in this case of course it's JWT. Now if we take out the second part out of the token and we try to decode it with JavaScript, we're also going to get a JSON object, in this case we get a subject property, in this case this subject could be a user ID or email for example, and specifically here we get a MongoDB object ID, so this string over here refers to the actual ID of the user. Then we can also list out public and private claims, so in this case we get a name claim set to John Smith, which is the name of the user, and last up we also get issued at, which is set to the time when the token was created in seconds. So now that we have a better understanding of what JSON Web Token is and how it's structured, let's talk a bit about the security associated with JWT. So just like cookies used for authentications, of course the JWT tokens are also going to be signed with a secret. Most often it's going to be the HMAC SHA-256, but sometimes it's also going to be the RSA public private key pair. Either way, the signature guarantees that the token was not tampered with. So it allows the server to trust the token and also trust the data that's contained within the payload of that token. Once again, this protects us against any manipulation with the token, and if the modification to the token was done intentionally by the client, for example, if they try to increase the expiration time of that token, it's going to invalidate the token because the signature of that token will no longer match the body or the payload of that token. The JWT tokens are rarely encrypted, though they can be, and in fact there's actually a spec for it, known as JWE, but the reason that they're not encrypted is because the web clients actually need to be able to read the token payload, so they actually need to be able to access whatever information is contained within the payload body of that token. So in fact, if it is encrypted, it kind of defeats the purpose of JWT, because the clients won't be able to access any data that's contained inside of it. And now the secret to decrypt the JWT can't actually be stored on the client side because browsers don't really have any secure storage for these types of secrets. Now the JWT is also going to be encoded, in fact it's going to be base64 URL encoded, but once again this is not done for security, but it's only done for transport. Now this has an important implication for JWT, and it is the fact that the payload of JWT can actually be decoded and read by anyone because anyone can basically take that token and base64 URL decode it to read the information that's contained inside of it. It is for this reason that we can't put any sensitive or private information inside of the JWT payload. And it also makes an important point that access tokens should also be short-lived. So even if that token was stolen, its lifespan should be a short period of time to minimize the damage. As I alluded to previously, JWT tokens have a security implication. And specifically, they have an important implication for XSS attacks or cross-site scripting attacks. Once again, we're going to talk about security later on in the series, but for the time being, what you need to know about XSS is that they're basically client-side script injections. So it's a vulnerability of servers whereby an attacker can basically inject inject client-side code, so JavaScript code, to the server, so when the server returns back a response, that response will contain the injected malicious script. So the browser will try to execute that code thinking that it comes from the server, when in fact it was maliciously injected by the attacker. Now what does this have to do with JWT? Well, as it turns out, JWTs are often stored in local storage, or session storage for that matter. That poses a problem because malicious code can actually have access to client storage. And if it does through an XSS attack, that means that third-party code can actually try to steal user information from the token, because remember the token is base64 URL encoded, 
but it doesn't mean that you can't simply decode it to read the data. So malicious code can actually abuse that in order to steal the data from the token, but it can also try to initiate AJAX requests on behalf of the signed in user to the server. So for instance, it might try to do unauthorized actions or try to cause some damage or very simply that code can just send off the JWT token to a malicious site. As we're gonna see later on, XSS attacks are mitigated by sanitizing and also escaping user input. But this is really just a measure of defense. There's no silver bullet for XSS attacks as we're gonna see, but at least we can try to bring down the damage to the minimum. So now that we're talking about JWT and XSS attacks, let's also talk briefly about client-side storage. So as I said before, JWTs are often stored in client storage, be it local storage or session storage. The difference is that the local storage will have no expiration time whatsoever, but this session storage will be cleared out when the page is closed by the user. So we'll talk specifically about local storage since it's the more popular one for JWT among the two. The local storage is nothing but a browser key value store with a very simple JavaScript API. So it's basically a NoSQL web oriented storage for browsers. Some of the pros is that this type of storage is domain specific. So that is to say that every site will have its own local storage and other sites cannot possibly have access to read or write to the local storage from a different site. The local storage will also have a maximum size higher than the cookie. So the cookies themselves are capped at four kilobytes per cookie, whereas local storage will allow you to put as much as five megabytes of data per domain or per site. But there are also downsides to local storage. Well, first of all, local storage is plain text, and that means that it's not really secure by design. Everything that's stored in local storage is gonna be stored in plain text and in plain view. The other disadvantage is that the local storage is also limited to string data. And this means that if we want to store objects or JSON data inside of it, we will have to serialize those objects and store it in the JSON string format. The other thing is that local storage can be used by web workers, and it's really stored permanently unless the client removes it explicitly. And one of the big downsides related to XSS attacks is that local storage is also accessible to any JavaScript code running on the web page. So whether that code is authorized by the server or if it was injected by an attacker, it will execute either way. And it's going to have the same level of access and privileges just as any other JavaScript code from your server. Now in the context of JWT, this basically means that any script on the site can try to steal tokens or can try to impersonate users using whatever tokens are stored in local storage. So once again, local storage is best for public and non-sensitive string data, but it's really worth for any type of private or sensitive data because all of that data is easily and readily available through JavaScript. And it's also not useful for non-string data unless you serialize it yourself. And last up, it's also not very great for offline capabilities or web workers. There are more sophisticated approaches out there and local storage is simply not the best option for offline storage. So we've talked a lot about sessions and we've talked about JWT, but we haven't really compared the two. Let's go ahead and look at the most common use case of using sessions and cookies for authentication. So some of the advantages is that session IDs, as we talked about before, are opaque and really carry no meaningful data inside of them, meaning that if the session cookie is stolen, the attacker will be able to infer any useful data out of that cookie. And the cookies are also secured with special flags. So we talked about same origin flag, we talked about HTTP only flag, as well as HTTPS flags. These flags really add an extra layer of protection for cookies. And when talking about HTTP only cookies used for auth, they can't actually be compromised with XSS exploits because those cookies are not accessible by JavaScript client side. So all of these three points make cookies a very secure and popular approach to authentication on the web. The last point is that cookies have also been battle tested for many, many years, and they've been used widely in many languages and frameworks on the web. Now, of course, we have several downsides. Well, first of all, the server, of course, has to take care of all the sessions and it has to store every user session in memory. So once again, this could be a Redis storage or a database. But either way, the sessions have to be managed by the server for every user. The session authentication also has to be secured against CSRF. Now, even though there's already well-developed defense mechanisms against CSRF, it's still something that has to be taken care of on the server. So it's an extra thing to take care of. And then the other point that people often bring up is that horizontal scaling with sessions becomes more challenging. And that's really because all of the user sessions have to be stored somewhere. Now, if you only have one web server and one storage server, it's really not a problem. But if you try to expand your system 
to multiple web servers and multiple session storage servers, it becomes more challenging to share the data between those servers. So it becomes a problem or a risk of a single point of failure. But luckily, there are mechanisms to go around that. We have sticky sessions that are used in tandem with load balancing, but still it becomes an issue with session auth, whereas it's not really such a big problem when dealing with tokens. So when talking about JWT, some of the advantages are such that the server doesn't have to keep track of user sessions. So this is going to be a relief to the server storage because now we don't have to actually store those user sessions anywhere. The tokens are going to be distributed to the clients and it's going to be the responsibility of the client to keep track of that token. Now, as I mentioned before, the horizontal scaling now becomes easier as opposed to session-based auth because now any server will be able to verify the token by its signature and also cross-origin resource sharing is also not an issue anymore because if the authorization header will contain the token instead of the cookie then we won't have to worry about that cookie being available on different domains or different subdomains the token can simply be embedded inside of the authorization header so we don't have to worry about course at all the other advantage is that front-end and back-end architecture is also going to be decoupled that's because you can have a back-end api that issues tokens to the clients, and the clients themselves could be front-end applications that don't have any awareness of the API, but simply make API requests to that server to get the tokens. And this also makes it easier to integrate with mobile apps as well. And the last one I'll mention is that the token-based auth remains operational even if cookies are disabled in the browser. Of course, the disadvantages are that the server actually still has to maintain a storage. In this case, it has to maintain a record of revoked tokens because in some cases users will want to change the password or if they forgot the password they will try to reset it and in this case we'll have to blacklist the old tokens so that they can be used anymore until the expiry time but in this case this actually defeats the purpose of stateless tokens because as we talked about before JWT is supposed to be a stateless auth on the web but because we still have to maintain a blacklist of revoked tokens, that means that the authentication mechanism will still be stateful and not stateless. And then on the same note, a whitelist of active user sessions is actually more secure than maintaining a blacklist of revoked tokens. Because if you maintain a blacklist, you're essentially saying that everybody is allowed to the system except those who possess the token listed in this blacklist. But when dealing with user sessions, it's a bit more secure because you're saying nobody's allowed to access the system except those few people who are listed in the whitelist. And now when scaling a token-based authentication system, for example, when using JWT, we actually have to make sure to share the secret between the servers. Because if you have multiple web servers that need to carry out the verification of JWT tokens, you still have to make sure that those servers have the same secret so that they can actually establish the authenticity of those tokens. So the secret has to be shared. Now, the other point is that data in the token sometimes tends to go stale. That's because whatever data you put inside of the token, including the name, this can sometimes be the permissions that the user holds, that information contained within the token is essentially cached. And now when that information gets out of sync with the server, that's when we say that the token goes stale because whatever information is contained within it is no longer accurate. Another important point is that tokens stored in client storage are in fact vulnerable to XSS attacks, as we mentioned before. And once again, if the JWT is compromised, which can happen if an XSS attack was successful, the attacker will be able to decode the token as well as steal any user information or permissions or metadata from that token. And the script will also be able to access website resources on the user's behalf. Because now that you have the JWT token, you can actually go ahead and make Ajax requests to the server pretending to be the user whose JWT was stolen. And the last point I'll mention is that JWT, even though it still works if the cookies are disabled in the browser, it only works if the JavaScript is enabled. Because most often JWT is used in tandem with client storage, so the client storage is a JavaScript API. And then if JavaScript is disabled for whatever reason by the user, that means that JWT will not be operational. So now having talked about that, what are the options for authentication and single page applications and APIs on the web? We really have three different solutions. So first of all, we have sessions. We also have stateless JWT and we have stateful JWT. Now stateless JWT is the traditional use case for JWT. It's when the user payload is embedded inside of the token. The token is then signed with a secret and base64 URL encoded. It's gonna be typically sent via the authorization header 
and it's also going to be stored inside of local storage or session storage in plain text. The server is then going to retrieve the user information from the token. It's going to trust the token because the token was signed by that same server or other servers in the cluster using the same secret and no user sessions are going to be stored server side. We only really have to store revoked tokens on the server because we have to make sure to maintain a blacklist of those tokens. And now the refresh tokens are also going to be sent along with the access tokens to renew the access tokens in case they expire. So this is the traditional model for JWT and this is what's known as stateless JWT. There's also another variation of JWT and this one is known as stateful JWT. It's when we store user references, so it could be, for example, a user ID embedded inside of the token. So we don't store the entire user payload, but we actually only store, for example, the user ID reference. So in essence, a unique identifier that we can use to trace back to the user logged into the system. The token is then once again going to be signed with a secret, and it's also going to be base64 URL encoded. It's going to be sent as an HTTP only cookie to the client using the set cookie header, of course. This way that cookie won't be accessible to the JavaScript code. And that cookie is going to be sent along with each request to the server. And in fact, we're also going to often issue another cookie. This one is going to be X CSRF token cookie to prevent CSRF attacks. And this one is going to be non HTTP only. This way the JavaScript code can actually access that cookie and read from it. The value of that cookie is going to be retrieved by the client and send back to the server with each subsequent request. So once again, the server is only going to embed a user reference to the token, and it's going to be used to retrieve user information from the database. So the server will no longer rely on the data stored inside of the payload of the token, but it's actually going to rely on the information stored in the database. Now, once again, no user sessions are stored service side either, but we still have to maintain a blacklist of revoked tokens just like before. Now with the sessions, it becomes very similar to stateful JWT. Once again, sessions are going to be persisted server side and they're also gonna be linked back to the user by the session ID, which is once again, a unique identifier to track back the user who's logged into the system. And the session ID is also going to be signed. It's often signed with a symmetric key, so a secret stored on the server. And that session ID is going to be placed in a cookie oftentimes an HTTP only cookie sent back by the server instead of a set cookie header. And once again, it's also going to be protected with several flags, including HTTP only secure to make it only available over HTTPS channel. And it can also be protected by the same site flag. The scope of the cookie is going to be limited with the domain and path attributes. And then we can also send in another cookie to actually hold the CSRF token. So in this case, because we are dealing with a single page application and the front end is still decoupled from the back end, we can't really send back the token inside of the payload, but we can still issue it alongside with the session ID cookie in a separate cookie, or we can also embed it inside the response payload as well. So the verdict for single page applications and APIs is that sessions are probably better suited for the web. And this includes web applications and websites. Now the natural question of course would be why not JWT? Well, there's quite a few reasons I listed out. First of all, server state still has to be maintained either way. So we won't be able to achieve a full stateless auth because we still have to maintain a blacklist of revoked tokens with JWT or in the case of sessions, we still have to maintain every single user session that's active on the server. The sessions are also easily extended or invalidated. It's very easy to do so server side, but in the case of JWT, we also have to manage the refresh tokens as well. So it becomes a little bit more complicated with JWT. We also have to remember that in session auth, all of the data is stored server side as opposed to inside of the payload of the token of the JWT token. It also means that that data cannot possibly be leaked through XSS that easily because the JavaScript code won't have access to that data directly. The other point is that CSRF is also easier to mitigate than XSS in the case of session auth. There are very well developed protection mechanisms against CSRF and they're far easier to implement than XSS protection. But of course, XSS still remains a concern even for session based authentication. Another point for session auth is that data never goes stale because remember with JWT, the data inside the token can sometimes go out of sync with the server but in case of session identifiers stored in a cookie, the only way to access the data is through the server. So in effect, everything that we get from the server 
is always going to be in sync with the actual database. The sessions are also generally easier to set up and manage, and that's really because sessions are more widely adopted among programming languages and also frameworks out there. And the last point I'll mention with regards to scaling is that most applications and most sites really don't require enterprise level scaling. So the advantages that JWT offers us are really not that useful for most websites. There are several important points I'll mention before closing off this video, and it's the fact that we have to remember that, regardless of the authentication mechanism, XSS attacks can still compromise user accounts and can still cause a lot of damage to the system. So in case of JWT, malicious scripts can leak out the tokens from local storage. They can also access those tokens and then make AJAX requests to send off those tokens in the authorization header to malicious websites. And lastly, even with session auth, if we have an XSS vulnerability in the system and a malicious code gets into our website, it can still make AJAX requests to our server with the HTTP only cookies attached to those requests. So because those requests will be outgoing from the same website and from the same origin, the HTTP only cookies, even though they're not accessible to JavaScript, they're still going to be attached to the request to the server. So the server will still think that the requests are coming from the authenticated user. So in fact, malicious scripts will still be able to impersonate users and perform unwanted and unauthorized actions on behalf of those users. So to make it short and simple, XSS is still a major concern whether you're implementing JWT or session-based OAuth. Another important point is that we also have to make sure to enable SSL and HTTPS on the website. This is of course a given and must absolutely be enabled on the site. And lastly, we also have to take care of security headers, which we're gonna talk about in the series as well. So to finish this off, there's really no silver bullet solution for authentication. You might also want to consider auxiliary measures to enhance your authentication, whether it's JWT or whether it's based on sessions. So you might want to consider AP verification, user agent verification, two-factor auth, as well as API throttling. And finally, if you're interested in learning more about the presentation, I've included a bunch of resources at the end of the file. You're going to be able to find the Markdown presentation on GitHub. So if you're interested to learn more, make sure to go ahead and check out the resources I included. If there was one that I would recommend out of five, it would probably be the second one under the article section. This one is titled Stop Using JWT for Sessions. Now I know that it sounds a bit clickbaity, but as it turns out, this article is very solid and it makes a lot of sound and reasonable arguments. So I do recommend that you go and check it out yourself. So this has been Authentication on the Web. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'm going to see you next time. Take care.